welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 166, which reads as follows. Atadathang parathena bahunapi nahapaye Atadatham mabinyaya sadatha pasutosya Which means... Uh, what is good, what is important or useful, what is good for oneself. One should never abandon or neglect what is good for oneself in favor of what is good for someone else, even though it might be much. Even though it may be more. Uh, fully knowing what is good for oneself, one should be intent upon one's own good. Selfish, one should be selfish, that's basically it. Well, there's context to this, first of all, but there is, it, there, we've talked about this before, and they're interesting sort of philosophical implications of this, surrounding this, to understand why it might actually be the right teaching. Of course, we tend to think it is because it's promoted as being something the Buddha taught, and well, we have faith in him, so let's explore this together and see how it's useful for our meditation, of course. So the story goes, and this is a great story, it's a short story as, as usual, but um, it's a memorable one, one that I used recently and used before to make a point. So the Buddha uh, spent 45 years of his life teaching other people, and we remember from our sutta study on Saturday that he didn't want to teach, he wasn't inclined to teach, but he was invited to teach and so he did. He spent 45 years tirelessly teaching. And that's really the interesting thing about it. It's uh, He was quite sort of self-absorbed. So probably the wrong word for it, but it's the only best word we have, or best sort of word in English. He was very much fixed and focused on on happiness, really, and on the peace that he had attained, without any interest in teaching. It just didn't, and no reason occurred to him to teach. Uh, and and so that sort of life that he had set out for him would have been quite peaceful and carefree. I mean, carefree, of course, but. Um, without any uh, requirements put on him. It would have been a life of living in, in peace and meditation. And uh, so clearly that was fine for him. That was easy to understand how that, was, that would be considered to be perfectly natural to incline in that direction. But then... As soon as he was invited to teach, he inclined in a different direction, towards a life that was the complete opposite. And I think that says something important about the idea of not caring. You know, the Buddha was such that it would have been fine either way. And the 45 years he did spend were, in many ways, uh, externally chaotic and stressful. I mean, they were must have been physically stressful on on the Buddha, uh, and there must have been a lot more pain and discomfort physically. Tiring, how tiring it must have been, and uh, that was just as fine with him. There was no preference in that sense. Uh, but at the end of the forty-five years, he was ready to leave, ready to be done. 
and he made a determination that this was it, that he wasn't going to try and live out his life to a hundred years. He thought 80, 80 is enough. And so he, he looked at, at his students and his monks, female monks, male monks, female lay disciples, male lay disciples, they had all become quite uh, established. And the Sangha was, was, by that time, quite prominent in India and uh, well established such that it would, he knew it would carry his teachings far into the future. So he thought, well, I've done, I've done what was asked. So that's that. And he declared, he, he, he made known to his students that he, in four months he would be passing away into Parinibbana, that would be it. They'd never see him again. No one would ever see him again. He would never have any further contact with existence of any sort. Which was disturbing, to say the least, to many of his followers. Those monks who were not yet uh, sotapanna, who, were not, who had not yet seen this truth for themselves were quite disturbed and saddened by and and perturbed in the sense that it made them want to spend all their time with the Buddha you know, rather than doing anything else they thought well if for four months if that's going to be it then we better just stay with him all the time so we can learn as much as we can and so they did this this was their thinking, well, if the Buddha is going to pass away in four months, we better spend all our time around him. This is it. Seems reasonable, I think, no? But one monk, one monk, and the monk's name was Atadatta. Atadatta. Atadatta means, Atadatta, the D is just is superfluous, it's not meaningful. Atta means self, and Atta means uh, benefit or meaning or purpose. In this case, purpose or, or no benefit, I suppose. Interest, one's own interest in that sense. So atta is self, one who has one's own interest, or one who looks after one's own interest, or one who is selfish, self-centered, self-focused, focused on what is good for oneself. He thought to himself, now oh, the Buddha is going to pass away in four months. I should spend all my time meditating away from the Buddha. Well, he said it quite better than that. He said, Ahanchamhi avita rago. I indeed am not free from passion. He says, I will, I will put out effort for, for becoming an arahant while the Buddha is still alive, while the Buddha is still here. Dharma neyiva arahatataya asatari dharma neyiva arahatataya vayamisam. And so he never went to see the Buddha for these four months, or for some part of these four months, he just spent all his time meditating. And the other monks who woke up early in the morning and immediately went to the Buddha's kuti to wait for him to come out and to stay, stay with him and learn from him, they saw this and they said, hey, why aren't you, uh, what's wrong with you that you don't ever come and see the Buddha? They noticed that he never went to see the Buddha. It was like he was avoiding the Buddha, in fact, whereas before he would have maybe gone to pay respect or listen to the Buddha's teaching, he just didn't go to see the Buddha. So they thought, what's with this guy? And they, it looks like they dragged him to, to the Buddha. They actually picked him up and took him to the Buddha. And they, the Buddha said, why are you, why are you bringing this monk? Why, why are you bringing him here? And they said, oh, one day this, this monk is doing this, he's, he's off, he's avoiding you. And the Buddha looked at him and said, 
What are, why are you doing this? Why are you behaving in this way? And so he told them, he said, but Bhante, you have said that in four months you're going to, be pa you're going to pass into Parinibbana. And I thought, as long as you're still here, I will strive for the attainment of Arahantship. And the Buddha looks at him and, uh, let's see, I've heard that he actually says sadhu. It's one of the few times. What does it say? Yeah, the Buddha sat satha tasa sadhu karang datva. So I don't know that he brought his hands up, probably not, but sadhu karang datva. He gave him uh, praise, basically. He, he, he approved, gave his approval. And then he said, bhikkhuve yasamayi sineho ati. For who? Uh, whoever has love for me, basically, whoever has love for me, they should act in the, in the same way as this monk who has his own benefit at heart. And that's how we got the name. That's how we got the name Atadatta, one who looks after their own benefit. And then he taught this verse, Atadattam Pratina, and so on. So there's a few few lessons here. Um, the first one, because the story isn't exactly in regards to uh, choosing between one's own benefit and the benefit of others, right? What's one's own interest and what's in the interest of other people? It's more about choosing what is truly useful and beneficial over what is actually uh, what is actually uh, what is actually just superficial right and this sort of teaching is quite important for cultural buddhists i mean buddhist societies can be quite wonderful in terms of supporting buddhism you know, providing a sort of a, a nest or a, a protection with the culture, you know, because it becomes a part of society and this protection of Buddhism and this revering of Buddhism. But it's very, very easy and it's a sort of a slippery slope to, to eventually um, see greater importance in the cultural aspects than the more what we might call religious aspects or the more important aspects to put a fine point on it um, and so we can see that sort of thing happening here where the monks had become quite um, comfortable with what had become what we might call Buddhism and the Buddha and so they revered him and they revered him so much that they forgot, uh, they forgot what was important. Uh, and so this sort of teaching, this story along with this verse is very important as Buddhism uh, grows and as, as, as we carry Buddhism, it's important that we carry teachings like this with us that remind us what aspects of life are important and which are superfluous. Uh, I think it shows sort of a, a higher sense of purpose uh, and, and that we sometimes get quite carried away with appearance, you know, what, what is expected of us. You know, how we want to look and how we want other people to see us and how we feel obligated to others, how we feel like we fit into our roles in society. I mean, it speaks to a greater sort of uh, going against the stream, not doing things just because that's what you, you think is expected of you, and being bold enough to really say, no, this isn't actually useful. 
this isn't actually beneficial. Right? Because it seems insensitive of this monk to stop caring about the Buddha and stop uh, hanging around with the Buddha. Um, it, on the one hand, I mean, that's not the only thing here. There's another sense that these monks thought that, hey, this is useful. It's good for us to learn all we can from the Buddha. When in fact the Buddha just kept telling them, go meditate, go meditate. You know, like people who read, who watch all my videos, but never actually meditate. I've got thousands, I've got 1,500 videos on YouTube. If you've watched them all, you've watched too many. <laughs> if you've watched half of them, you've watched too many. I mean, I appreciate that people are interested in the teachings, but this is a good example for us, reminding us what is what is really useful. And uh, this monk certainly found it. I mean, listening to teachings is easier, makes you feel good, right? Meditation, you see these people here who come to do meditation courses, is very difficult. But it's a diff the difference between the conceptual and the real. Meditation deals with the real, it deals with reality. It has a power that uh, study and listening, learning doesn't. It has the power to reach into the very mechanics of experience and change them and uh, refine them. Refine them simply by seeing them more clearly not making mistakes based on ignorance. Seeing the mistakes that we make based on ignorance, based on our imperfect understanding of experience. So that's the first part, this difference between what is useful and not useful. The second part, of course, is this idea, beneficial to others, beneficial to self, and I guess that sort of relates to the idea of uh, what's expected of you. You know, more than expected is kind of this implication that you're disrespecting the Buddha. Um, you're not f fulfilling your obligation. And in fact, there may have been a sense of obligation. Okay, every day everybody has to go and the Buddha's going to give a talk. You have to go listen. The Buddha comes out. You have to go and pay respect to him. This and this and this. If you don't go and see the Buddha, it's considered to be not so good. And the Buddha didn't think so. The Buddha didn't agree with this. He discounted this, the concerns of these monks and said, Look, if you love me, stop following this carcass around. You know, this one monk who followed the Buddha everywhere, he said, What are you doing following this carcass around? He said, stop following the carcass. Stop following this rotten, putrid thing with nine holes ex exuding all sorts of filth through nine holes and the skin as well. Stop following this bag of garbage around. Stop doing what's not useful. Stop stop buying into the expectations and these 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 uh, roles and these artifices that we set up and ask yourself what's important. You know, I'd like to meditate, but I can't, uh, this reason, that reason. We're caught up in so much. No. We get caught up in so much and we think, oh, I'll just put meditation aside because I have all these other commitments and so on. I mean, it's not, we're not denouncing such things, but we have to understand that if you don't do it, it won't get done. You don't get you don't get uh, substitution points for being a good Buddhist and so on. So, um, but but more interesting, especially in regards to this verse, is this real question: Well, is it really better, or you know, always better to look out for your own interest instead of suppose teaching someone else meditation? At other times, the Buddha has made clear that helping others is helping yourself. When you help yourself, you're helping others. When you help others, you're helping yourself. 
and how that works is is it's it's a kindness it's um, being nice to someone it's it's a cultivation of goodness to help others so that's a support for your own practice um, and so there's not as much of a um, There's not as much of a dichotomy here or a divergence here. It's not as much of an either-or situation. Uh, we talk about being selfish and self-centered, but to be to be to be clear, it means doing what's in your own best interest, which only sounds problematic until you realize that helping others is helping yourself. Um, and really, the point is your focus. What is your focus? Is your focus to cure the sufferings of all the living beings on earth, well, it's probably a problematic uh, goal considering the numbers and the, mere, the, the types of beings out there. It's a losing cause, a losing battle, but if your focus and your intention is to become enlightened, it really doesn't matter whether you help others or help yourself. If your focus and your intent in doing all these things, or, or whatever you do, you know, the more things, the better. The greater your focus on helping yourself, you know, it all becomes the practice. Eating becomes meditation, right? So teaching becomes, if not meditation, it becomes a support for your meditation as you help others. And And uh, so the final thing that I would say about this is in regards to the, this paying respect to the Buddha, because the Buddha also says here that someone who loves me, right, if they wish to res pay respect to me, it's not through garlands and flowers and incense. They should uh, worship me through their practice of the Dhamma. And that th this this teaching, of course, is elsewhere. It's in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. It's one of the last things the Buddha says: is you know, flowers, candles, incense, not really the way. And I thought I had more to say about that, but um, that's really the the, the main point. Right, is that uh, the, the the practice which the Buddha recommends? It's not all these many things and that we talk about in Buddhism that giving charity or, or you know, things like communal harmony and being good to other people and so on. The, uh, the the recommendation here is, I mean, what I want to say is, is uh, this is why we come to a meditation center and do a meditation retreat. This is explicitly the sort of thing that the Buddha recommended, not to just be a good Buddhist or even uh, even learn to meditate. You know, really, ideally, all of the people that we teach, that I teach on the internet, and um, you know, they get interested in, and start to pick up this type of meditation, ideally they find a way someday, somehow, to do what Atadatta did, this, this monk who got the name Atadatta, who really understood what was to his benefit, what was the greatest thing to do, and went off and practiced on their own. I mean, I, I, I don't know if it's clear, but the, the idea is that uh, we really can only benefit ourselves. When you talk about benefiting others, what's the best you can do for them? You, know, you can talk about healing their wounds or giving them food to eat or money or shelter, all those things, and that's useful, beneficial, but it's, it's not nearly as beneficial as um, them going off and practicing meditation to become enlightened. I mean, obviously there's a hierarchy of needs that need to be taken care of, but you talk about what is, has the greatest benefit and the greatest result, it's helping oneself.
And so whether you help yourself or whether you help other people to help yourself, the focus always has to be on this, the helping of oneself. And if that's your focus, you know, that's, that's what, um, you know, that's the way to become free from suffering. That's the, the best way to be. And if you take it to its logical conclusion, it means going off on your own and cultivating proper and intensive meditation practice. So, this verse relates to our practice. For those of you who are, are here doing the Course, to be encouraged that you are Atta You are people who know your own benefit. You've done something that's very difficult, and people watching here on the internet often maybe wish they could do, maybe don't even feel up to doing. But you found the, the path to truly help yourselves and to dive right into what is to your own benefit. And it's to be commended, and it's the reason why I have great respect for anyone who does it, having done it myself. a great and profound thing, so at the least this should give encouragement to those of us who are here and, and encouragement to those who haven't come yet that this is the kind of thing that makes one a true practitioner of the Buddha's teaching. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. <laughs>